All right. Let's uh, let me let me um, introduce um, my friend and longtime uh, collaborator. Now, we've not actually written anything together, but we've written about each other's work. I think um, we've worked together in different capacities. I think you've been in a journal that I've edited, uh, a, a mm -hmm. collection of articles on case. Perhaps you were in that one as well, That's Alec. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's so let me let me start with the by saying you can read what's what's up here, but I will I will just uh, give a personal note then on. So um, I've I've always known about Alec because he's been he he's um, uh, I think we met in in Australia when you were working mm. at RCLT um, and at La Trobe University, and then you um, started working at uh, NTU in in Singapore uh, along with Randy Lapola, and so you were really a strong. Uh, place there for Tibeto Burman studies, and you had some excellent PhDs that you um, graduated from there. And um, so, I since since that time when you started there, uh, of course you you published an excellent grammar of uh, Meng Sen A, which uh, I had the you know absolute joy of being able to review. It was an excellent grammar. I always uh, have my students read it when we're reading when we're looking at Tibeto Burman grammars. Um, and you've also received several grants that you, where you've been working on uh, relationships between language and migration. Um, and then uh, I know that you've also been doing things on folklore, right? And culture and language, uh, migration and so on. So in addition to your strong work in, in typology and um, I think your, some of your papers are really widely read, especially those that have to do with, say, um, language contact uh, between um, Nagamese and the um, tibeto burman languages of Nagaland. And you've looked in detail at specific kind of um, constructions, such as relative clause constructions, participle constructions, and so on. Some of your papers are so widely read for those particular topics. And so um, I think your name, if people are looking at tibeto burman studies very widely known. So we're really happy to have you here and come and talk about something quite different from all of those things that I've mentioned, which is the nitty gritty of, of dictionary making. So thank you for, for being here. And, and I'm gonna turn it over to you now to share the screen and start your presentation. Let me stop sharing so you can do that. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Governor, for your uh, generous introduction and acknowledgement of my um, attempts at um, contributions to uh, languages of Northeast India. And uh, certainly it is the case that originally I was focused more on publishing academia, uh, academic papers, but the last couple of years, I've felt like I, I should give something back to these communities that been uh, so helpful for helping me to establish my career and the best way that I can do this is by helping them to create dictionaries. So that's what has motivated my work for the last uh, couple of years and uh, I'll just see if I can work out how to advance my slides. Okay, good. So um, first I'll acknowledge the funding sources that have allowed me to do this work. And uh, I've had two grants recently from the Ministry of Education, and they've been really good for allowing me to start the work on the dictionaries. And I'm also really grateful to the members of the uh, so, uh, Young Nyan community, in particular, the dictionary team led by Mr. Bakil uh, Kiam, and also the Yim Kiong Dictionary team led by Dr. S.J. Akam. They've both been very important people for ensuring that the work continues, that it started and that it continues. And of course, um, my collaborator, uh, Dr. T. Temsen Ng Sang of the English and Foreign Languages University in Geelong. We worked together on um, RG 63 slash 16, and we're still working together on uh, papers dealing with the phonology of these languages and hopefully we'll have some um, publications from that in the near future. So today I'm going to 
Um, maybe just to address some important questions to begin with concerning who you're writing the dictionary for. And then I'm going to focus more on the orthography side and the collection side, because that's still the area that we're focused on at the moment and probably will be for a number of years. And we're starting to uh, look at what to include and how to present it as well. But the main focus is still on the collection and um, developing orthographies. Um, so that's where my expertise lays. Uh, I'm still learning other things about making dictionaries. It's quite a big topic and it's something that can go on for decades, in fact. But I'm going to share with you how we can shorten the period of time it might take by talking about um, word collection methodologies, use of technology, and uh, how we can apply it to dictionary making, a little bit on lexical entries, what's to be included, the kinds of resources that we can use for finding out about um, the uh, uh, lexical items we want to include, um, a bit more on documenting biodiversity in Northeast India, and finally, um, what might be included in the front matter of a dictionary. So, uh, I'm just going to try and get my um, hide my my uh, my my controls. Okay, so I'll begin with just uh, orienting you to where I'm doing this work. I started off. First, um, I tried a dictionary project in Huflong with the Zemi community back in 2015. And that was just to see how well the rapid words collection, which I'll be describing later, um, was for um, trying to collect dictionary data. Hang on a moment, and I'll just um, ask for a bit of quiet from my family. Can you keep your voices down, please? Sorry about that. Okay, so um, once a uh, workshop in, in Hufflong came to work pretty well for the week, then I thought I'd do some more work. I was contacted by a long-term collaborator, uh, Pekio, and he asked me to help create a dictionary for and a writing system for his particular dialect of Kiamningan. And so I started that in 2017. We had a workshop. We um, did it again in 2019, and I was just there recently in 2022 to make up for all the time that has been lost because of COVID. And in 2019, I also ran a dictionary workshop in Shamator with the Yimkiong community um, after I was contacted um, some, some 10 years after working briefly with the Yimkiong community and again asked to help to create a dictionary for their language. And this is the important thing to, to have actually the motivation for the dictionaries to come from the communities themselves. Because in 2018, Thimsa Nungsang and I went to Kinsa village in Mugokchung district, uh, where we thought we would run a dictionary project on Mongsen Ao, thinking that it would be good to have a dictionary for this and an orthography for this language. But we were the ones who took the idea there and uh, it wasn't the community. And uh, we just don't have the motivation in that community to keep going. So that is one project that's um, not uh, failed to keep going. And I guess it's because um, we were the ones who initiated it rather than the community. It seems to be an important point. So uh, first, uh, a few questions. Are you going to create a bilingual or a monolingual dictionary? Uh, because that's going to determine how you're going to structure it. I'm going to be talking about bilingual dictionaries. That's um, my particular focus. Um, also, I want to think about what the purpose of the dictionary is. Is it for the children of a community to learn uh, to develop literacy? Or are you mostly creating a dictionary for the academic community, such as Jim Matasoff's Grammar of Lahu? Um, or is it possible to have multiple objectives so that you um, contribute to serving the community as well as providing useful data for the academic community? And uh, just reiterating the importance of 
having support from the actual community, this is really important. Maybe your project's not going to do all that well. Maybe it won't be continued if there's not uh, initiation from the community and, and support from the community. Uh, because uh, as I mentioned before, making a dictionary can extend over decades. So it's important that um, we've got basically a team in place that does most of the work. And eventually once everyone knows their role, we can serve more as consultants. Um, is there an existing orthography to support literacy? Um, that's an important question as well. Is If there's an existing one, um, is it going to be good? Is it going to encourage literacy or is it going to hinder it? And if you've got to start off from scratch with creating a dictionary, then which variety of a particular language do you select? Certainly, you want to have one that is widely understood by um, all the different varieties that are spoken in the community, if possible. I guess in the past, um, missionaries probably chose places where their safety was assured uh, during that time when it was quite uh, dangerous to go up into the hills of Nagaland and perhaps other places. So sometimes um, not the best choice was necessarily made. Uh, ends up becoming the prestige language once it's got an orthography. So going on to orthography design, if we look at the background, we find that uh, many of these dictionaries that are in, maybe still in use or initially created um, were started by, in the 19th century, by people who had very little knowledge of linguistics and certainly no knowledge of um, the concept of the phoneme. It wasn't really appreciated until Sapir's 1933 paper. So, um, and also was rarely ever transcribed. Um, I guess for a monolingual dictionary, that may not necessarily be so important, but I think if you've got a language that's got a syllable-based tone system, then it's incumbent upon us linguists to make sure that we're fully representing the language and tone is a part of it. So we shouldn't ignore that. We often, um, sounds that could not be represented by Roman uh, writing systems were not represented. So glottal stops were quite often left off and voiceless sounds maybe were not represented either. Because of um, the lack of knowledge of um, phonemics, there was often a many to one relationship between um, the symbol to sound or even vice versa. Uh, so the legacy of all this is that we've got all these bad scripts in many cases that are now rather difficult to revise. And there's things that don't support literacy or standardization, perhaps even in use. So um, that's a, a problem. And, you know, it's difficult to revise a bad script uh, because you've got to get the community to accept it. It's, um, a very good book that was published in 1947, it still has relevance, and this is Pike's uh, publication. And he identifies these five, of, five objectives. He suggests that scripts have got to be scientifically adequate. Uh, otherwise, you're not going to get the best reading and teaching results. They should represent the actual linguistic structure. They shouldn't cause offense to the people who you plan for them to use. Um, so in the context of Northeast India, I would imagine it would be quite difficult and perhaps not so successful to try and introduce a Devanagari script, certainly in, in Nagaland because of the um, difficult relationship the indigenous people have had with um, previous governments and with the army in particular. Um, <clears throat> ideally, we, we would want to uh, adapt traditional alphabets to, um, of the region to the, um, the orthography you intend to use, because then that's building on prior knowledge and it's going to be easier for people to learn a script if there are well, alphabetical uh, symbols that are already familiar to them. And this last point is very important. It's got to be easy to write and print as well. But the problem is that 
all of these uh, phonemic goals don't necessarily coincide with social goals. Um, this is the thing about creating orthographies. It's as much a social activity as it is a scientific kind of an activity. So um, here are Pike's principles, which suggests there should be a one-to-one -one correspondence between phoneme and symbol, um, meaning that there's no greater or lesser number of symbols to phonemes, and then you're going to avoid arbitrary spellings that children will have to memorize. The spelling should reflect sounds. In this respect, the Devanagari script of Hindi is fantastic because um, it does, the way you write it represents the way that you spell it. Uh, four, that allophones of single phonemes should be assigned uh, a single symbol. This can be somewhat difficult depending on um, how well you can explain this concept to the community. Um, the representation of tone should be based on the analysis of the language consistently written on every word. I, I fully agree with that. Um, assimilated loans, maybe you would have to borrow, you might have to use extra symbols in order to account for those loan words. And uh, you can just augment your orthography with those as necessary. Now, um, recording data is very important at the beginning, and it's good to start with a decent word list. I recommend using the glosses that you'll find of the uh, reconstructed proto tibeto Burman forms from Benedict 1972. There's about 525, I think. Um, Matisoff, 2003, his handbook has also got a good list. And you might want to augment that by adding uh, lexical items that are important to the area. Um, but that will give you 500 plus words. And that should be sufficient for capturing all of the contrast that you expect to find in a language. And you also, have a, a good basis for doing that tonal analysis as well. It's really important to use a carrier sentence to elicit each lexical item. And that's because a lot of these languages in the Northeast also use intonation as well as tone. And uh, you're going to see when I show you the Patso Kiamningan data, just how important it is to have a carrier sentence or perhaps even a number of carrier sentences if you find that there are certain um, tone sandy effects from the um, particular syllables and their tones flanking the, the target. Um, but if you've got your, your every single elicitation in a carrier sentence, you're going to have useful data for doing tonal analysis. Words recorded in isolation are going to create nightmares for you. Normally what I do is I get a few male and female speakers. I find a recording studio to book. There's lots of them in Northeast India because there's so many musicians and they make recording studios in their homes. You could hire a recording studio and make a, a very decent recording. I did this in, uh, I did it in even half long. There was a recording studio there and I do it in Dimapur as well. Um, most places, most towns you're going to find, um, there'll be someone with a recording studio. Otherwise, uh, you need to find a quiet place because then you'll get really good data for acoustic analysis, plus you'll be able to archive it later on and other people can use it. The, the, um, the, the next thing, once you've got your recordings done, is to do a phonemic analysis and to design your orthography based on the phonemic analysis. Um, so you need to also identify the phonemes of the language as part of this and decide on some kind of representation that's acceptable to the community. I'll show you some different ways it can be done. Um, the orthography, as I mentioned before, needs to be easily typed and ideally it will draw on prior knowledge. And that's why most of us are coming up with um, scripts based on um, Roman characters, because that's what people are used to, primarily because of the proselytization, proselytization by the missionaries introducing um, Romanized scripts. So if it's already familiar, it's going to be easier for people to learn. 
And of course, you have to consult with the community to get their acceptance. That's really important. Um, you have to make some modifications, perhaps, to address the community's concerns while still trying to adhere to those principles of Pike. But um, you, know, you just have to accept the fact that the best script in the world is useless unless your community agrees to use it. Um, and if they don't want to use it, then what's, what's the point? There's no point to it. So you've got to be willing to compromise, even if um, it means making unpalatable decisions, ones that you think are going to create problems in the future. I'm uh, just sharing the Batso Kiamningan consonants, the phoneme uh, consonants, consonant phonemes, plus the orthographic symbols. Like most of the languages that are found in this central part of Nagaland, there's a voiceless aspirated, uh, voiceless unaspirated contrast. And I decided to represent that with digraphs using um, EH, TH, KH, etc., because it's going to be a bilingual dictionary. And I want the users to realize that the, the voice plosive sounds represented by B, D, and G in English are different sounds to the sounds that they've got in their own language. So it means that um, you've got to type a little bit more to create a word, but it's going to reinforce that the sound system of, of Batso is different from the sound system of English. Um, I initially, using a C for the voiceless unaspirated affricate here, but uh, community members, um, not just these Batso people, but elsewhere, all struggled with this. And so it's better to use J because that's what um, they're used to from their familiarity with English. Everything else is pretty straightforward otherwise. Um, there's an unusual voiceless um, labial vela um, at the bottom of the chart here. Uh, that only occurs in one word, crab. But anyway, I've included it because maybe more words with it will turn up. The vowels are pretty straightforward. Um, I'm using this uh, U with the umlaut dots for the uh, schwa. This is a bit of a problem, at least for typing diacritics, because it's hard to stack um, digraphs, um, tonal uh, diacritics. I should say, on top of the umlaut dots. But um, Nathan Hill just recently asked me if I would be interested in developing SwiftKey for this language. And SwiftKey, which I'm not familiar with yet, sounds like it's going to be fantastic because apparently uh, Nate Sims has used it for a variety of Changik spoken in Southwest China, and it works really well, even with um, tonal diacritics. So that's something I have to explore in the future. Um, analyzing the tone systems, you know, it's a really difficult thing. It's probably the hardest thing we have to do with these languages. So it's no wonder that so many people who work in Northeast India tend to ignore marking tone. Most of the orthographies don't have tone marking. Um, what I suggest you do is once you've recorded your 500 plus words is if you're lucky and you've got monosyllables, then separate them into tone categories based first on your auditory perception, and then check them with native speakers and get them to see if uh, your groups are uniform for the same uh, particular tone category. And you might have to shuffle them around until you've got all the elicitations of each tone categories being uniformly represented by a single tone. Uh, that ends up becoming incredibly useful later on when you're trying to uh, create um, a tonally notated lexicon. So what I'm showing you here is the list that we ended up going for. And this was based on quite a lot of work. Uh, this was a nightmare, this language, tonally. I'll show you why shortly. But we've got um, uh, four tones that contrast on open syllables. And we've got another two, which you find um, uh, can be treated as allotones of the mid-level 3-3 three, three and the mid-falling 3-1. And this is what they look like. This is using Hiram Ring's 
uh, Prat script, which is used in Prat to identify first the rhyme of the syllable, and then to sample the fundamental frequency at about 20 points, and also the duration of the rhyme. And then you can plot fundamental frequency as an absolute um, function of duration, and you end up with um, a very nice representation. And this really, really solved a lot of our problems. You can see why it's so important to record your words in a carrier sentence, because in isolation, you've got, let's look at this, you've got three pairs of identical contours. And the only thing that distinguishes them is the fundamental frequency, the pitch at the beginning of the, the onset of the rhyme. So in isolation, you can't tell whether you've got this um, high falling or this mid falling one, this high level one or this mid level one, or this, um, uh, well, the shorter ones are a little bit easier, but it's still difficult. So um, you really need to make sure that you record your data in a carrier sentence, and then at least you can compare the target word and its tones to the syllable tone preceding and the syllable tone following. And this middle one is less likely to be affected by intonation, whereas ones in isolation are going to be affected by intonation as well. So you end up measuring intonation rather than the underlying tone of the syllable. Um, so recommend um, only eliciting data in, uh, well, at least eliciting data in a carrier sentence as well as um, in isolation. Now, um, I'm, why am I such a stickler for marking the tone? Well, you know, I think it's going to speed up reading because if you've got a tone language and you don't mark tone and you've got lots and lots of homographs, first you've got to read your sentence and try and work out what those homographs possibly could represent. And then once you've done all that, you go back to the beginning of your sentence and you start reading. To go, oh, okay, I've got to sort it sorted out. You get halfway and you realize, oh no, this isn't a mid-tone, it's actually a low tone. And so you have to re pass the sentence, go back to the beginning and do it again. By the time you finish reading your first sentence, the English speaker's at the end of the page, probably. So um, it, it renders reading tedious and slow if you're not using tone to mark the um, well, the different homographs to distinguish them. So just to give you an example from Zeme, here you've got um, bye, 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 and you've got another bye there, right? So that's going to create a problem for the reader. They're going to have to work out what those, what those different buys could possibly mean by assigning them tone. But if the script already assigns them tone, then it's going to make it much, much easier to pass the sentence and to understand it. So um, I guess it shouldn't be much lower for a Zemi reader than um, it is for that person reading in English. Um, if you do mark tone, of course, it's a lot more work, but I feel that, you know, it's what we have to do as linguists. There's no reason why we should ignore tone. I mean, we don't ignore coders, do we? And tones are easily as important as coders. Um, choice of diacritics, well, um, well, yeah, of course, you can, you can use these, these uh, cutes and graves and circumflexes and macrons and things like that. I suggest, um, well, this is before I learned about Swift key, you can do, you can type these on a smart file by just holding down the key and then you'll have that choice. It's a little bit slow though, I appreciate. Um, maybe, and I talked about this with Chobina as well, we were discussing the importance of tone and we thought that that it's probably important to have tone represented for something that serves to standardize the language like a dictionary but whether people actually use them when they're writing if they're native speakers maybe it's not so important however i'm hoping that this swift key will make it um, possible to type just as quickly with the tonal diacritics because it will interpret and it will anticipate what you're writing. So um, maybe we can move to a, a stage where people, even when they're using smartphones and they're texting to each other, they still represent the tones of the languages. 
Um, that's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> um, the Zenia people already use this circumflex for a high tone, and so I thought it would be smart just to include it rather than making them learn something new. You want to make it as easy as possible for them to learn your orthography and um, build on what's already there if possible. But another option is to use quotey characters if your community will accept it. When we did the Mongsen workshop, the Mongsen Al workshop in Kansai Village, uh, they actually agreed to using these quotey characters that were needed by the orthography. So um, this is one of the side things that I do that Shobana mentioned was working with folklore. And I work with an artist colleague in my university and her art students, and they illustrate folk tales um, because I'm trying to create materials to encourage kids to start reading and writing in their own languages. And this is also a nice way of documenting their cultures as well. So um, we created this reading book and we're marking the, the high tone syllables with the X's here and the low tones with the Q's and mid tone with no mark. And of course it makes it super fast to type your word into um, your electronic um, corpus because you don't need to remove your fingers from the QWERTY keyboard. It's, it's really, really quick. But it looks a bit ugly, don't you think? Maybe your community would not accept um, doing this to their language. So um, again, you really have to consult the community and get them on side because um, they're not going to use a script that they think is ugly. Okay, now I'm going to talk about these rapid words collection dictionary workshops that um, a colleague at uh, into you, František Kartochvil, uh, an Austronesianist and a Papuanist, put me onto a few years ago and um, motivated me to try it out firstly in Hufflong and then uh, adopt it elsewhere. So um, I'm going to just walk you through how useful these rapid word collection methodologies are. And these are just some snaps of us working together in um, uh, Patso village on uh, collecting data. So it's, it's based on the idea of semantic domains. It was developed by um, SIL people who've got a very strong interest in orthographies and creating dictionaries. And um, I uh, am very, very grateful for all of the wonderful software that they've created and um, which I um, shamelessly exploit for, uh, well, purposes of language documentation. So um, rapid words collections based on um, 1800 separate semantic domains. And what you do is you get teams of native speakers to think of and write down words that belong to lists in, in each of these semantic domains. You can collect a lot of um, dictionary entries in a very short period of time. Uh, these images are just Tempsters working on a whiteboard. That's a useful thing to have because um, here he's uh, trying to sort out the tone categories that uh, we looked at earlier. Um, it's nice to have a whiteboard and to be able to sit with a bunch of people to discuss stuff. I find it really useful. You can usually get one, borrow one from a school or something in a, in a village. Um, and down below, my tone transcribers are adding the, the tones to the words that were collected. There's a link to the um, website where you can find out about this methodology. And I've got a whole bunch of links um, in a slide at the end. Um, you need quite a lot of people to do this, um, usually around about 40, a manager to record attendance because I, I, I pay off everyone. I'm taking them away from their, their fields. So I've got to give them an incentive to come and join me in the workshop. And um, we need about six teams of native speakers, four to five people, a team leader, a scribe. We also need a separate team of these glosses who can, um, who've got good knowledge of the, the two languages that you're working in. And um, a, a team of tone transcribers as well. You've got to very carefully select them and train them um, because people just don't have any idea about tone in these uncodified languages. And you need some typists as well to type in the data. So um, usually maybe four, three, four, five days is enough to train people up and um, show them mistakes. 
you want to try and deal with the mistakes because it's going to save you time if you don't have to go back and fix things later on. Once everyone's trained up, then you can begin. So uh, I have a whole lot of folders laid out on a table, each with um, blank sheets of paper and a place for the semantic domain and various other codes to be put in. And then the team leader selects a particular semantic domain that she or he thinks that her group or his group can um, provide a lot of words for. And they think of as many words as possible in about 20 minutes, and the scribe writes them all down. Of course, the scribe's got to be trained to deal with the orthography as well. Um, then once that, that list is, is, people have thought of as many words as they possibly can, and it's slowed down, then um, the list is passed by the team leader to the glosses, and they add the English glosses. And then it's passed on to the tone transcribers to mark tone. Finally, it goes to the typists, and they add them into this, we say, corpus. And this continues on for a couple of weeks. And um, this is just, I, I thought I'd just use screenshots because it's probably going to be difficult to switch to the actual application. And um, I've only got, what, about 50 minutes, I suppose, to talk. So I've just got some screenshots to show you here. So this is the, the um, first page of the app for uh, the Kiamningan Dictionary. You can see that you've got a whole lot of um, things that you can click on down here. You can make a, a simple PDF of your dictionary. You can open it in Lexic Pro. You can uh, save it either to a laptop or to a USB drive, or you can even set up a, um, a server in Bayap University in Thailand and upload it to the internet, which is uh, very cool. And I know that Shobana does this with Flex Data as well. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, the words are collected by the teams according to semantic domains, and they're put into the, the app eventually by the typist. And here's just a, a screenshot. So you can see that um, uh, it's all a, still a little bit rough. We've got, I'm putting in affixes as well. There's just too many. It's a really agglutinative language, this one, like many of the languages that we work on in this area. And it would be just crazy to try and put in lists of affixes into the introduction, the front material. So um, I'm just identifying them with affixes and listing them in the as dictionary items. And you can put in um, a well bunch of different uh, things. You, you choose what you want to put in, you set it up in the configuration file. And um, the only thing is that we say is no longer actively supported by SIL. So you might consider using Fieldworks Language Explorer for future workshops because it'll also do the same thing, except that it's got a much, much deeper learning curve. And quite often we're working with people with very rudimentary knowledge of computers. And that's why I like this particular program. It's very simple. Uh, it's easy for people to use, and that makes it valuable. And even though it's not supported, there are still people in SIL who you can email if you've got problems. And um, uh, we've been able to solve most of the issues that we've had so far. So uh, I still recommend it if you want a simple kind of a, uh, a program to use for people who are not are necessarily terribly au fait with using computers. And um, the, it, well, in the, the description you'll find in that link I shared earlier, you'll see that they claim they can, they can get up to 1500 words a day. I think probably you could do that if you weren't working on a tone language, but it's more likely about 500 a day for a tone language. It's still very good, right? Okay, so uh, here's a shot just showing the semantic domains. It's already set up for you. It's um, so beautifully organized. So you just pull down the list, find the, um, the, the right category and put your examples in there. And uh, you, can, you can, well, have a part of speech label, of course. You can put in example sentences. You can even put in a recording of the utterance, which is pretty handy. Um, because then you can hear and um, you can incorporate that into a phone app as well. You can put in images, 
And as I mentioned, you just choose the options and the level of complexity that you want to use. Here's a, an example of an entry for uh, Pao Chok Chia. And um, the guys thought up, a, this was just called a foreign moth to begin with. But when I pointed out that it's got snake heads as a defense mechanism against predators, they decided they'd call it um, snake moth instead. So uh, this is now entered. I've got the IPA as well. I think that's a useful addition. And um, the scientific name um, and a picture as well. It's a nice picture to include. It explains the name as well. And I showed you before that you can just create a, a PDF printout very easily. This is a, a shot from um, early days, still very rough, lots of things to do. But um, once you've done your workshop, if you wanted to say, give something to the community members who participated, then this could be something that they take home with them as well. It's something tangible, uh, very easy to make. Um, pretty straightforward, I think. A uh, few things you need to tweak to make sure that it displays properly. but. Um, yeah, it's quite um, good. I mentioned before that you can set up a, um, you can register your dictionary project on Language Depot, and then you can connect to the internet. Here I've um, got uh, an option to in a flash drive to save my data. In the workshop, we share flash drives. Um, now that I'm back in Singapore, I can just upload stuff language depot and my speakers in um, Doonsang and uh, Noklak district can just download it and they can upload stuff when they've got a connection and I can download that as well. So it's been great in this COVID period because we've been able to keep working together. Uh, lexical entry, of course we need a head word as we saw before, phonemic representation, part of speech is important. Ideally, we want to have just a concise one word equivalent in the um, second language, English, if, if that's what you're using. Otherwise, you might have to use an explanatory phrase that translates the lexical entry if you can't do it with a single word. Um, you can add related sentences in sub entries as well. Um, example sentences are very useful in translation. I'd like to get 10,000 words and an example sentence for every lexical entry if possible, and then we'll release it. Um, but botanical and scientific names are good for flora and fauna. Images also can be useful to break up the monotony as well of reading, um, you know, dense text after dense text. You can add in derivations as well if they're not so transparent. And um, commentary, for example, may be different terms that are used by certain clans for kinship. To be the citation form. This is um, you know something that we have to deal with eventually. Um, most of the publications I've seen that describe making dictionaries suggest it should be the closest thing to a basic stem. The less inflection, the better. And <clears throat> well, it's also got to be whatever the native speakers think is a natural representation of um, of that word for Cookie Chin languages. Should it be stem one or stem two? These are the kinds of issues you'll have to think about. What about inalienably possessed nouns? Do you just put in the root? Would that then make it difficult for native speakers? Certainly the less abstract, the, the better. If you're doing this just for linguists, you might want to have the alphabetization all arranged via just roots. But of course that could be difficult for uh, native speakers who and not, you know, sophisticated linguists. Things like, for example, the classificatory nominal suffixes that you get on nouns in many languages, like asap, nest in yimkyung, or even the um, nominalizing morphology you get on citation forms, like uh, akipki in yimkyung, or ashao to go down in patso kiamningan. Uh, so this is something you need to think about as well. What's going to be the most accessible for your, your users? And I mentioned that if you've got lots and lots of affixes, then probably it's better to put them in as dictionary entries. But if you don't have all that many, you might be able to deal with them just in the introduction and um, put them in and have examples demonstrating their use. 
Again, it will work on, will depend on the complexity of your particular language. Um, the cost. Okay, we're looking at about, well, I, my, what I pay is 500 rupees per person per day, which is probably a, a little bit on the generous side. But as I mentioned, I'm, I'm taking people away from their fields and I want to encourage them to keep coming. So 500 rupees a day does the trick. And then I also inject money into the community by asking the, the women to create morning and afternoon teas and snacks and things like that. And so I cater for that as well. And, you know, there's such fun, these dictionary workshops. I really feel like I become part of the community. We're all working together for a, um, you know, a, a, a good end result. And uh, it's great fun. You might need money to hire a generator if power is intermittent and uh, fuel as well to run it. Tables and chairs might be provided by the church if you've got a church with um, those facilities or maybe a school. You need... Uh, three or four laptops with everything loaded on it, and you need antivirus because if you get a in you know a virus into your your program, then you might end up losing all of your data. So that's really important. There are free ones like AVG that seem to work okay. A printer because you need to print out stuff. These blank sheets for the semantic domains. Lots of stationery, USB drives for merging the files. I mentioned how useful a a whiteboard is, and um, total cost is usually around about three to four lakhs or 3,500 to 5,000 US dollars um, for about a three week workshop, which I think is a pretty reasonable investment for what you end up creating. Um, there are places where you can get funding for this, EODP would be an obvious one, and um, endangered languages, um, uh, the, in, uh, the Endangered Languages Foundation as well might be able to provide money. Um, of course, you need to have a very good orthography worked out in advance, or you're going to be wasting a lot of time when you really should be collecting the words. So that's why it's so important to do a preliminary recording of your word list and make sure you're familiar with the phonology and you've got something that you can present to the community early on. Um, so that you don't end up wasting a whole lot of time explaining it all to the community. Um, that's probably pretty important. So uh, what are the advantages of the rapid word collection methodology? Well, it's quick and it's convenient. Get a basic dictionary within three weeks. I love how it's community-based. The software is pretty easy to use. And once you've got your dictionary team of core people assembled, it should keep going. And of course, you need to have a good leader. Fortunately, I've, I've got a very good leader in uh, Pekeo, and he's kept running dictionary workshops. And when I couldn't use money to go traveling to Nagaland to do my research, I was still able to help uh, cover his costs because he kept a record of all of the people who came, their accommodation expenses and things like that. Um, it's also really, really easy to merge the data and access it from anywhere in the world that's got an internet connection, and we can export it for all these other uses, which is also great. You can also export Flex, by the way, um, for these kinds of things. I also mentioned that. I don't, I don't use Flex myself. I'm happy using Toolbox, but um, uh, I know that Turbiner uh, is encouraging people to use Flex now because it's um, well supported. Um, practically, as I mentioned, just to, to reinforce this idea, you've got to have a phonological analysis and a practical orthography for this first, and then you can fine tune it in those first couple of days with the, the workshop. Um, really important to have separate tone transcribers because they just don't have a clue about tone. You have to train people who've got a good ear, give them a list, and then start getting them to compare the new words to the list so that they're ready to go once the lists start coming in with the, um, the words from the semantic domains. Um, and I've been using uh, WhatsApp pretty successfully to keep going with these workshops. It's been great as well, because we've been able to um, keep going. I'm just going to talk a bit about resources. I've got about 15 minutes to go. Probably I'll only be about another five minutes, Shogunar, but that's okay. 
So um, this is just discussing. I've um, I realised that I uh, I don't have permission to reveal people's names, so I've redacted names and phone numbers here with the blue. But um, you can see how we were trying to work out what some trees were called for a another folktale that um, talks about the the reason why the best flowering trees are found up in the mountains and the boring ones are found down on the low plains. And um, we we're trying to identify what they were. So it was very useful to discuss all this from Singapore with the people in Nagaland. And uh, one of the illustrators working with my artist colleague wanted to know what the light was like so she could represent this adequately in her folklore that she was a folklore tale that she was um, creating illustrations for. So one of the team members took this photograph and sent it to her. Um, this is great. You can get voiceovers as well. If you want to hear what a particular word sounds like, because maybe the tones are being transcribed, then you can just ask for it in your elicitation sentence and, um, and get it here. Uh, it's very, very useful having social media for doing this kind of thing. Um, another thing that I've just discovered is this wonderful picture, this. And botany, I'm just a dullard when it comes to botany. I hardly have any knowledge of it. And it's always been a concern because how do I find out what the uh, botanical names of things are if I can't identify them? Do I take, you know, leaves and flowers and photographs and um, carry that then to somewhere like Guwahati where there's a, a botany department or, yeah, nightmare. But I've um, got this picture, this app, and it cost me just um, 2,000 rupees a year, and it's really, really accurate. So I just walk around the village with um, some native speakers, and we take photos, and then I identify them in picture this, make a screenshot, send it with the dictionary team via WhatsApp. Usually one of the people is with me as a member, and they enter it into We Say later on, along with the um, scientific name, like, uh, for example, the foxtail millet here. So uh, this is, um, this just really simplifies. It's like having a, a botanist in my pocket. It's fantastic, really recommend it. Made, made it so much easier to collect information. Uh, and, you know, we can really contribute to documenting biodiversity as well as languages, because um, when I was in Wui village in summer, uh, we saw this snake. Unfortunately, it was killed. I'm trying to encourage um, community members to think about preserving the biodiversity as well as their cultural diversity as well. Um, but of course, snakes are snakes, and um, it's normal for humans to kill snakes. So anyway, this one got killed. It's a bit unusual. It's some kind of, we thought it was, well, I thought it was some kind of a keelback, but I couldn't find any images of um, this particular one. It turned out to be an orange collared keelback. And the um, helpful people at the reptile database who I emailed with this um, image were able to send it on to herpetologists and they identified it for me. Uh, so that was uh, really helpful. And they mentioned that they just don't have enough information on the, the, the reptiles of this area. So to keep sending them photos or even take a, um, a, a sample of the skin so that uh, the DNA could help to identify them. I don't know whether I could do that with maybe in the winter with no refrigeration. But um, anyway, that's also an option. You'd have to be dead to do that, I guess, though. Um, there's another good website, India Biodiversity. It's got uh, images in it. Sometimes you find useful things, like uh, I found this paper on uh, academia.edu, and it's got um, roadkill of reptiles in Nagaland, and all of those scientific names. So I sent this to my dictionary team and asked them to Google the scientific names, find the images, and then they can enter this data into the dictionary as well. So you can see how we can contribute to other disciplines as well by doing our dictionary work. It's not just working on languages, we're, we're doing a whole lot of interdisciplinary stuff as well, potentially. And there's reference books as well. This can be useful if they've got good color plates. Um, you get the scientific names as well. These are quite useful with um, to use with hunters in, because hunters have got usually a rich knowledge of biodiversity, certainly of fauna. Um, 
So these two are good and you'll probably find others. Some people might have trouble with um, trying to identify animals with images. So you have to be a little bit careful with this, but it's still a useful adjunct to collecting data. Okay, so the second last thing I'm going to talk about is creating smartphone dictionary apps. And um, this is so cool. Uh, you create these lexical interchange files in we say, and you also create them in Flex as well. Now you can import these into SIL's dictionary app builder. It's a little bit convoluted. It takes a while to set it up, but it does produce this uh, functional reversible bilingual dictionary and you can search in both languages. I love this, it's so cost-effective. It doesn't cost anything. You can share it via Bluetooth with anyone who's got a smartphone. Um, most people have got Androids, it seems, in Northeast India. So I've made it specifically for Android phones. And the other nice thing is that you can keep updating it. It doesn't take um, much work. It's maybe about 10 minutes to update it if you've got more data. And you can keep releasing new versions of it. So at the moment, it's just the dictionary team who've got it because we, we don't want to make it available until we're happy that everyone will be um, satisfied with our work and we've still got a long way to go. But it's a useful tool even to, um, to collect more words and to check things that need to be looked at because it's very fast to navigate your way through a phone app compared to navigating through um, WeSay. Um, and I guess that, you know, this is the technology that's going to be used for writing in the future. So this is where we should concentrate our efforts, I think, create uh, dictionary um, smartphone apps. And um, then people will start to get more and more, more and more familiar with literacy, with writing, and we can extend this into other things as well. Like for example, at the moment, I'm involved in making um, mobile phone game apps, which is designed for children based on folk tales. But, um, you know, the kids are thinking that, well, they will be thinking that they're playing a game. Actually, they're learning how to read our script because we've written all the instructions in Butso as well. And we've got voiceovers, um, which I'll be recording in the winter of all of the instructions. So they'll hear the instructions and they'll see them written in the script as they're playing. And they'll, they'll learn how to read and write in this language quickly, I believe. Uh, last thing is the front matter for the dictionary. And this will be the last thing that you produce, I imagine. You'd want to have acknowledgements, certainly a discussion of the phonology, the orthographic representation, conventions, keywords as well with, with examples demonstrating pronunciation of each letter um, in a language that's intelligible to the users, a list of abbreviations. Uh, some dictionaries have a, a diagram showing the structure of an entry, and I think that's very useful as well to orient the reader. And I think it's very important to have a grammatical sketch as well, certainly discussing word classes, lists of inflectional and derivational morphology if you don't add it. Maybe you could include some examples anyway just to show um, the structure, case marking paradigms, description of the structure and nominal and verbal stems if they're quite agglutinative and, and complex, and anything else of importance for understanding those example sentences. And um, here are some references for you, not, not many, just a few things. This Bartholomew and Schoenhals was a useful thing to read. It's on languages of Mexico, but still highly applicable or to all dictionary um, languages for making dictionaries. And uh, this edited volume by William Frawley and Hill and Pamela Munro is also quite useful. And of course, I recommend reading Pike as well. So um, there are some links here on the last slide. And um, that's all I want to cover. Uh, I've got about five minutes. So sorry if I took a little bit longer, Shavana. No, that was great. Thank you so much. And, and you know, uh, we should definitely get some questions for you. It seemed like, you know, maybe we should say, does anybody have questions about orthography? And then we can talk about um, 
uh, headwords because there were you know clear divisions in 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 the presentation. But you gave us a lot to think about. Um, I did put some questions myself in the in the shared document that we we put up. But let me ask, and I'll and I'll ask my questions after I ask uh, anyone else here if they had anything they wanted to ask. Let me open it up here. Let's see. I think rather than putting your hand up, you might just want to unmute and ask your question. All right, let me ask a question to start with then, and maybe it'll start some discussion off. So you talked about tone and the importance of, of transcribing the tone. And so I'm wondering then when people write, are they going to be writing the phonetic tone or the phonemic tone of the, uh, of the item? Because as you're putting words into bins, that's really the, the tone of that word in that carrier phrase, but it may change slightly depending on where it occurs in a sentence. So will people be learning the, they'll be doing the phonemic tone I'm, I'm supposing and not the phonetic tone. Yeah, this is a, I mean, it's an important question that you ask and it's something that um, I still struggle with because um, as you know, there's a hell of a lot of tone sandy in these languages and identifying the underlying tone, I guess, is the, the aim. And then native speakers, I guess, will automatically apply the tone sandy rules. Um, but yeah, it's, this is a, a major problem and you might find that you have to use a range of um, carrier sentences with different combinations of tones on either side to work out exactly what the tone sandy patterns are. Is it even possible to work out the tone sandy patterns? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, I remember Phil Rose, who was my master's supervisor, talking about how some uh, of the Chinese languages have got tone sandy so complex that uh, some people have suggested it's impossible to even write tone sandy rules. They seem to be remembered as part of the particular construction by native speakers. So um, if that's true, then I guess we're, um, yeah, we're, uh, you know, <laughs> pushing a big rock uphill with this. Maybe we can never possibly come up with a way of dealing with the tone sandy. Yeah, and and see, then my fear is also then there's a little bit of inconsistency then that comes in in the way people write because they're listening to things and writing what they hear, and so um, the same word may be spelt in different ways depending on you know the, the phonetics of it, and so then yeah, but as you're saying, <laughs> we have to think through that a little bit, uh, but I yeah. definitely feel like in the in the if, if you've got the orthography, then right next to it, you should have the IPA with the tone indicated, uh, even if it's not going to be in the spelling when people are writing. But I, I think that's two different ways of looking at it. And it's, it, I would be curious to see, because one of the things you said, and I'll stop talking after this, but one of the things you talked about was readability. And I think that would be a really interesting experiment to do with people where you took all the tones out and then put all the tones back in and have something in between as well, like over-specified, mid-specified, no specification, and what are the rates of comprehension and, and, and speed of reading? That would be kind of a cool, somebody's MA thesis, like waiting yeah. to be done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that would but be I guess it, that would require somebody learning how to read the orthography with the tonal marking as well, I guess, and then maybe that would bias them. Um, Right. It's a difficult one. I'm not sure how we're ever going to solve this problem. I'd be quite happy to get suggestions from our audience if they have any thoughts if they've dealt with this themselves in the past. That would be great. I have a quick question. Uh, Alec, I have a quick question in the um, when you did it, showed us the uh, Camus uh, word the pronunciation in the IPA, um, you put between two forward slashes, um, but sometimes uh, IPA is written in square brackets. So what is the criteria for that? Okay, so the idea is that 
the this is an abstract representation of the phonemes that are um, uh, in the minds of the speaker, okay. um, the speakers. If I use square brackets, then it would be the the actual pronunciation with maybe um, different representations according to various allophones as well. So um, <clears throat> square brackets is is what you actually hear, and the forward slashes are the abstract representation. So like this, if I could ask you, how, how do you write the letter A? And you might write it in a number of different ways. You can write it in a capital, or you can write it in um, italics, or you can write it in lowercase, like bow here. But these are all the letter A for you, right? Mm -hmm. So we can then say that uh, this idea is, is an idea of, of the grapheme, but the grapheme's got allographs depending on the environment in which it's used. So for example, if you wrote that A at the beginning of a sentence in English, like a giant moth, then you have to use the uppercase. And if you don't have it in um, the beginning of a sentence or in a person's name, like my first name, or like your first name, then it would um, it, it would have to be uppercase as well, but elsewhere it's lowercase. So um, this is the idea of the phoneme that was elaborated on in um, uh, Edward Sapir's 1933 paper. And he argued that native speakers have got an idea of the phoneme. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to capture that abstract representation by using the forward slashes rather than square brackets. Thank you. Uh, Sadaf, uh, Sadaf Munchi um, in the chat asked again about the phonemic versus the phonemic, uh, phonetic uh, for the orthographic representation. And she said, uh, it's, it, she said, I feel personally that it's very complicated and yeah, totally. Okay, so um, yeah, well, you know, I think, you know, if we, if we adhere to Pike's suggestions and we want to have a, we want to have a phonemic representation that, um, overlooks all of the allophonic variation that you get. Like, for example, if you look at uh, Clark's 1911 Dictionary of um, Al Naga, then you'll see that he's got pages and pages and pages of words that start with S-H-I. And that's because Clark didn't recognize that the voiceless um, post alveolar fricative sh is a allophone of the dental, the voiceless dental fricative s, and it's the high front vowel that causes it to palatalize. So um, uh, would it be acceptable to speakers if you just wrote si instead of shi? Because they're going to pronounce it as she anyway. It's um, an automatic thing for them. But would they accept that? Well, this is why I say it's a uh, a social activity as well as a scientific activity because you need to make sure that your community is happy to use the orthography that you create and they may want to include some allophones because of you know perhaps a traditional writing system or just their own feeling that uh, somehow that's a separate sound even though phonemically we know it's not and we can predict the environments in which it occurs just like we can with um, graphemes like capital A's and lowercase A's. Um, I, think, I, yeah, I think that's a major point that you're pointing out, Alec, because um, some of the communities like Ao, uh, Angami or Lota and all this, they'll say, oh, for a hundred years, we have used this way of writing. Why do you want us to change now another way? It may be scientifically, scientifically correct, but you know, it's going to cause more confusion for us. And this is the way we've been using it for a hundred years. Everybody knows it's written, it should be written. I mean, it's being written this way. So why change? You know, that's the that's a question that people keep asking. Yes, that's that's right, Father Abraham. I, I think it's an issue that we'll continually come up against, especially if uh, we're dealing with scripts that were created by missionaries, you know, more than a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to be adaptable. Um, 
Uh, Sadaf, I'm not sure if I answered your question correctly um, or satisfactorily. Maybe you can just yeah, yeah, turn on your mic. Yeah, I personally, um, um, thank you for the presentation. I uh, find it very complicated because, um, especially when there's dialectal variation also, I, it, it's a lot, I mean, you have to think about a lot of things like historical, <laughs> what was the origin of the word and how did it look like? It, it gets extremely complicated when you're working mm. with variations like dialectal variations also. So yeah. thank you, yeah, yeah, that was, yeah. that was. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, I, I didn't actually talk about this, but um, in these, these uh, non-codified languages, you find that every single village sometimes has got a different way of speaking. And uh, if a speaker is good, they can identify what village, say a speaker of Mong Senau comes from, because there is, as um, Sadaf mentioned, quite a lot of variation. So you know, can you deal with that as well in a single dictionary? I think probably <laughs> it's, yeah, better just to work on one variety and choose a variety that's got the, the widest comprehensive uh, comprehension so that everyone can understand it. And then maybe once you've, you've done that, maybe then you can start working on different varieties and incorporating those. But uh, it's going to be a nightmare at, at first because um, there might have been different phoning systems, right? From village to yeah, village as it well. Yeah, is, it is a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's I, another yeah I, I wanted to know one thing uh, thank you for the inspiring presentation um, thank you. yeah um I just wanted to know this uh, program uh, regarding multilingual dictionary uh, which program do you suggest we say or flex well I think it's it's up to whatever you think you're comfortable with and perhaps even more importantly what the speech community is comfortable with if you can train them to use Flex, then uh, it's going to be useful as well for doing your interlinearization. Um, but if they have a, a very basic knowledge, then and you don't have the time to invest in teaching them how to use Flex, then we say we say it may be a viable alternative. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And um, there's a comment in the chat from Dhruvajit. Dhruv, do you what? Would you like to? Would you like me to read that? Would you like to share? Ah, uh, thank you so much, sir, for your presentation. It was really nice. But when you were talking about uh, like names of reptiles, birds, I think I also had the similar experience where there was a folk tale where there were around like six to seven types of different uh, lizards named and. Uh, till now, I haven't been able to find the names of some of them. So it's very hard sometimes to find the English equivalent names of those lizards. Like they cannot say like, oh, which one or how is it? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, I, it is very difficult. Um, they'll, they'll know what the name is in their uh, vernacular language because they're, they're like walking encyclopedias, aren't they? They're people who need to know the names of all of the the things in their environment because it's crucial to their survival and of course once we move to cities and we do our shopping in supermarkets we no longer need all of that knowledge and we lose it but um trying to put um uh well labels on these things is incredibly difficult we need a, a picture of this for reptiles as well but maybe that um that particular article which had all of the 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 roadkill reptiles could be useful to you. So you could, um, I, I put in the, you can find it on academia.edu and I included the bibliographic details. So maybe you could download that article and then you could um, Google the scientific names and check the images and you might be able to get names for many of your lizards. Um, yeah, otherwise, uh, uh, I'm not sure, probably there's going to be, you know, because none of the very little documentation of the fauna of the Northeast has been done and reptiles, it's possible that there's going to be things that are, you know, uh, reptiles that are completely undocumented, like that um, that one that, that I showed in the image, the orange, orange colored 
kill back. It's not meant to occur in Nagaland, according to the people I consulted. So um, that's why I think we can contribute to a knowledge of biodiversity as well, uh, as long as we can find the resources in order to identify the uh, flora and fauna that we're finding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tom asked the question, uh, does we say work in, with iOS? So I think no, right? These are mostly um, all the SIL software does not work with Mac, right? They only work with PC. Um, so mm. we say, I think it's the same. But just coming back to the question of, you know, using we say Flex or Lexic Pro and then the phone apps, it, it seems like when you're trying to train people to use that, a lot of effort goes into training them to use the software. Whereas really the hard part of it is collecting the words and doing the definitions correctly, getting the tones right, uh, doing the orthography. And if there is an automatic way of moving them into the software so that they can then be printed out and look pretty. Um, of course, Flex is useful for a lot more than that. But one of the things that Flex is really good for is a final product, right? It, it creates very nice looking things. If there's a way that um, people could work in something as rudimentary as a spreadsheet, where they can actually uh, track where they have gaps and people can get together and recheck things more easily because they're seeing it all in one place, that this might be a way when you're doing things with dialect differences. For example, I would have dialect one filled in and have dialect two filled in, but with gaps here and there that I would be able to see very quickly where I needed to fill in. And one of the things that we're looking at right now for those community members that are working with large groups of people not just uh, you know, a very controlled five days, but it's several people going to several different communities and working that they can all report back to a central person or central group of people who are working on a spreadsheet, keeping track of everything, marking who's coming and have regular meetings to check for, um, check for consistency and so on. And then having those things being moved into, not word by word, but in a, in a, in a swipe way, in a kind of a automated way moving into flex. And um, I don't know what, what people's thoughts are about that. Um, it seems like to me that that takes the, the work off of learning the software to really doing the language work and having other people who know how to do the software help with just that move, move into the software and generating the app these days is so easy, just as you showed. But anyway, the that's that's one of the things that we're we're trying to see if might be helpful. Yeah. All right. I'll just add that um, it is possible to use um, we say in iOS uh, iOS, but you need to use either Parallels or Hiram Ring is a, a Mac fan and he uses Wine um, crossover. And uh, it seems to work okay there in his Mac as well. Um, so it is possible, but of course it works better on a PC, a Windows machine. I, I end up taking a, a Windows machine with me when I do field work, although I prefer to work on a Mac just because everything works better. Mm -hmm. Great. Anybody else want to talk about um, head words or we are going to be discussing selecting headwords. You discussed that quite a bit, Alec. We want to know, uh, you know, what are community members going to be searching for versus what are the ways in the the historical um, composition of a of a, a lexeme, or what is the root, um, and you know, how do we decide what we're going to actually be listing? And we're going to show some examples uh, from Dimasa. Um, borrow and from uh, Manipuri to try to discuss that within within the group. But I don't know if anyone had any questions they wanted to ask Alec about that. Uh, well, probably I won't be able to say too much because um, uh, it's something that I, I haven't really come to terms with yet. I'm still at that early stage. So I'll be very interested to hear what um, you've been doing, um, Shobana, and what principles you're using to guide you as well, and then I can um, make use of those rather than um, having to do trial and error. <laughs> yeah, it seems like a, it's a lot of just, uh, yeah, trying to see what's going to work. I love the fact that in Flex, you could generate 
you know, different types of dictionaries, one which would be a word dictionary, which would maybe have the prefixes on there and another one, which would be a root dictionary that would then, um, you know, tell you the combinations that are possible. Here's the root, here are the kinds of prefixes that, that can go with it. So you could have things kind of organized um, in different ways, depending on who's mm -hmm. using the dictionary. But I think uh, with uh, Oza Mosiel, we had a we we looked at your dictionary which you created, and that was a question that came up on yours because they were organized by prefixes. And so we were asking, do we want to have the words organized by prefixes in one place, but by by the roots in another? So it's yeah, it's it's a question we definitely need to need to look at. Sadaf, did you want to did you want to say anything? No, I was um, this um, yeah the, the the question of prefixes also it's been like it's me driving me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like I I uh, I don't know I uh, I don't know what's the right way to do it because if you do it according to that then you have other like you solve one problem and then, then there's another problem. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, thank you. Sada, what do your speakers feel about this? Do what do they think is easiest? Having prefixes or just having roots? We haven't resolved the question of orthography. Like I've been working with uh, Grushaski for more than a decade, almost 15 years, mm. and we're still discussing orthography because there are three groups and it's been a nightmare uh, trying to have an agreement. Uh, but I think we're coming close now. We have a we have something and um, uh, almost agreed on having um, a, a, an orthography for Burushowski. So many meetings over the years and a lot of discussions, proposals, many proposals actually by different people. So now they're kind to, we had to like, I also had like a couple of proposals, but we had to have so many discussions on why this or that proposal is better or wh which particular symbol should be used. It took many years. I think they, are come, they have come close to an agreement on, but now the, the question is the institutional support and all that. Mm -hmm. That's also the next thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but now we're working on another language called Mankiali and it, this has a very small number of speakers. And um, so I'm hoping it will not pose that kind of problem because it's a smaller group, um, mm -hmm. but we still have to figure out what's best because it has, um, it's spoken in Pakistan and uh, most people, elderly especially, they prefer um, Persian Arabic based writing system, but it's not an ideal yeah. system for yeah. writing system for, for some of these languages which have many, many vowels and um, because it's, it's, it's a consonantal writing system originally. Mm -hmm. So it poses a lot of problems in reading and learnabilities and, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, interpretation so anyway yeah those are the challenges <laughs> hopefully we'll have some some solution interesting yeah whole different set of problems there with a different script it's interesting well alec we want to thank you for for starting us off with that great keynote and getting us thinking about a lot of things um we uh are going to continue i think with many of the topics that you've brought up um and we're going to have several people now. Um, we'll take a little break, I think. Uh, maybe we'll start back up in, in about, um, uh, we can start back up at nine, uh, sorry, 9.40, which gives us six minutes. Um, and then we'll have, uh, we'll play some videos of some of our participants here talking about their own projects and what, you know, how many different people have been involved and where they're at with those projects. So thank you again, and we're, we're very happy yeah. to yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you for your questions as well. And uh, thank you, Shobana, for inviting me to share something about my research. Great.